Restart. Yep. Doc's about to see. <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. It's been a while. Yes, indeed. Since we went to dinner together. Yes. Thank yes. you for doing this. My I pleasure. Spending some no, time. It, that's my pleasure. It's my this pleasure. This must be um, must be so nice for you to be back on campus. I asked myself a, a question. After 54 years at the NIH and almost 40 years as the director of an institute, you know, all the things that I've done, research and developing vaccines, what do I want to do for the last, you know, five or more years? And I think that it was pretty clear answer was to maybe serve as an inspiration for young people who are either interested in a career in public service or, or already are in a career of public service. Your undergraduate, you didn't study medicine though. You studied classics. I studied classics, uh, Greek, Latin, and the Romance language and philosophy in undergraduate, and then I went to medical school. I took just enough sciences to get me into medical school. Do you remember any of your classics? I could give you the first five lines of, of the Italy, on, of the Iliad in the Odyssey. On, I would be very, go <laughs> on. Ed Pamusa, Politrapon, Has Malapala. <laughs> you still remember it, that's for you. And being back at Georgetown where your children were born, you were married. And my wife went to undergraduate here and she got a PhD here. Right. So I got some pretty So big... this is home? Yeah, it is. It really is. When you come back here, do the students want to hang out with you yes. a lot? Yeah. Do they? That's nice, <laughs> I, I, right? I love it. <laughs> I think I've been interviewing you for over a dozen years. Easily. Ebola. Right. Zika. Zika. Obviously COVID. HIV. HIV. Yeah. And you're still doing it. I'm still doing it. Yeah. At the age of? 82. 82. Can I have what you have? <laughs> can you can you just sell what you have? How do you do it? How are you so? You I don't know. It's a con. you look seventy. Thank you. Do you work out all the time? Yeah, yeah, every day. Like workout, workout. No, mostly power walking. I used to run a lot of marathons and ten k's, but then I, a few years ago, switched it over to power walking. Right. And a, you know, a little bit with weights. Right. Very healthy diet. Not a... <laughs> <laughs> I, just no, I can't tell a lie. <laughs> Obviously, when we're doing this, you pull up in the two vans. Right. You have permanent security. That has changed since I first yeah. knew you. Yeah. You didn't right. have that. Well, the attacks on me that are, are you know, are so preposterous they would be ludicrous if they weren't so serious about the lies and the makeup and the conspiracy theories. It's like, you want to tell them, are you serious? <laughs> you know, just complete fabrication of things. It's just horrible. Do you ever get used to it? Have you got used to it? The whole no. people following you and... You never get used to it because I don't have any privacy anymore. I can't go up to the corner and grab toothpaste in the, right. in, in the Walgreens and, unless somebody comes. And that's, the, my wife is particularly disturbed by the lack of privacy yeah. that we have. I mean, look, the toll of your career is enough as being paid by yeah. your wife. The threats against my wife and my kids are almost equal to against me. By the way, there's Darwin Chapel where Chris and I were That's where you were married, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's really nice. Do you still go there? Do you no. still, you don't practice no. anymore, do you? I don't, no. Why? Ah, a number of complicated reasons. Go on, <laughs> we have a whole corridor. <laughs> I, first of all, I, I think my own personal ethics on life are, I think, enough to keep me going on the right path. And I think that the, there are enough negative aspects about the organizational church. Mm -hmm. uh, that you were very well aware of. I, I'm not against it. I identify myself as a Catholic. I was raised, I was baptized, I was confirmed, I was married in the church. My children were baptized in the church. But as far as practicing it, it seems almost like a pro forma thing that I don't really need to do. Are you happy, guys? Yeah. Okay. We um, were talking about half the country seems to love you and half the country 
seems to loathe you. There doesn't seem to be much in between. And I'm sure the numbers are not like that. Maybe it's, you know, 80 percent one way or 20 percent the other way. But the volume of the rhetoric on both sides right. is indicative of the kind of figure that you have become. Yeah. And how did how did it happen that a public health official becomes the recipient of so much yeah. divisiveness? I don't know precisely, but it, I believe it's the fact that the divisiveness generally throughout the world, but very profoundly in the United States, anyone who observes what's going on here in the United States realizes that we're living in, a, in an era of profound divisiveness. But I was really the person that articulated to the general public, the United States public, and then ultimately the global public, about what was going on and what needed to be done or not. That was fine, except that I got caught up in my own country of having to disagree publicly with the President of the United States, which was a painful thing for me to do. You know, the far right extremists think that I did that for political reasons. I was you know, a Nancy Pelosi plant or something in the White House, which I certainly wasn't. It was very uncomfortable for me, but I had to. I was forced to speak out and say, no, that's not true. It's not going to disappear like magic. Hydroxychloroquine is not the cure-all for this. That I generated, on the one hand, a lot of praise and, and sometimes even over-adulation on the part of people who are looking for some comfort and some realism and some sober facts about how they can protect themselves. On the other hand, it generated a, an incredible amount of hostility among the extremists. I, I don't like the extremes. It, it is not realistic that donuts are made with my face on them, that, you know, candles with my picture on them, voting is the sexiest. Is that almost as weird? That's, that, that is weird. And that's not positive. <laughs> so I, I'm in a situation where I'm a moderate type of a person and you have the extremes of, of just over the top adulation. And then you have extremes of over the top hate where people actually want to kill me. So becoming a sex symbol in your late 70s. That is not something that I, I, <laughs> I aspire to. <laughs> that's not one of my aspirations. If somebody had told you when you were graduating from medical school that this is what was going to happen to you, would you have chosen the same path? You know, when you, Caddy, it, it's a great question and the answer is yes. And I'll tell you why it's yes. Because if you look at the things that I was fortunate enough and privileged enough to have had the opportunity to make contributions in, in fact, as painful as the, the stress and the threats and the animosity towards me on the part of some, um, it was worth it. I mean, it was worth being involved from day one of HIV. Then when we're having a COVID outbreak, a historic outbreak, to be the director of the institute that was responsible, again, with the pharmaceutical companies for developing the life-saving vaccines, to me, all of the other baggage, which I wish wasn't there, mm -hmm. it's worth it to have had the opportunity to do that. I mean, you're not, you know, obviously you mentioned, you mentioned AIDS and the AIDS crisis, and, and I guess that's where your, the controversy around you started there with the demonstrations against you and the lack of what was perceived as a lack of yeah. research and commitment from the government and those even then, people wanted to murder you. Yeah, no, they didn't want to murder no, me. No, they said you were murdering them. <laughs> but they didn't want to murder me. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> Let me explain. I'm glad you brought that up because people often say, you know, they show pictures of the 1980s, the late 80s with demonstrations, Fauci, you're killing us. Yeah. And then they show pictures now of Steve Bannon saying, cut his head off and, you know, DeSantis saying, you know, get rid of him, hang him or what have you. The difference in those two things are like peanuts and watermelons difference. And the, and the reason is that with the HIV activists, they're making those kinds of statements against me 
were attention-getting devices. That is totally different than people who are spreading misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories, and almost malicious attacking science and scientists. It, it, is, it is beyond apples and oranges. It's completely different. Have you figured out how to puncture the balloon of misinformation? I don't know, how to, how to bring conspiracy theorists or vaccine skeptics over to what you're thinking? Is there, have you, do you think you've gained any insight that would be useful for everybody on that? It's very, very difficult. I'm trying to figure out what the best way is, what kind of commonalities that you have when, when you have people who are of the bent that are absolutely convinced that the election was stolen, even though you have 30 plus judges who have some of which were Trump appointees, who declared that absolutely it was not. It was a valid, well done election. What about vaccine skeptics? How, how do you talk to a vac? How do you, yeah. is there a way? Well, I, I have think- Have you converted anybody? Uh, yeah, I, I have. If you can get people to look at the data and at least have a conversation with you, you can win some of them over. There's nothing wrong with being a far conservative, far right, far left, nothing wrong with that. That makes for a healthy, heterogeneous society. But when you use that to make very, very poor decisions when it comes to your health, is really disturbing. So I don't know how to crack that nut, Caddy. I don't. You've described yourself as a kind of athlete when a new infectious disease comes along, one you haven't encountered before, that you feel like you're a runner. Yeah. That you're in a race. Yeah. Do you feel like most of the time you've won the race? When you look back at your career? Did you run fast enough? You know, if you run a race without any injuries <laughs> and you go over the finish line and you're fine, that's one kind of race. But going through the pain and the sorrow of, I mean, the, the first years from 1981 to the time we, were, we had therapies for HIV, the first one of which was in 87, but it only modified the disease. It didn't make anybody get fully in remission. Only until the mid and late 1990s, when we had the triple combinations of drugs. But those first years for me as a physician were, were the dark years of my professional life, but also the dark years of my life because I lived it, you know, 18, 19 hours a day of people, young, otherwise vigorous men who you got to know and like and love, <laughs> uh, coming in, essentially all of them dying. That was a very, very difficult experience to have. I mean, I still have a little bit of a post-traumatic stress when I think about those years. So did we ultimately win that race? Did we develop drugs that now, if a young person comes in who has newly acquired HIV and you put them on a triple combination, sometimes with one pill that contains three drugs and know that you can get the level of virus durably below detectable so that you can look the person in the eye and say, you can essentially live a normal lifespan all other things being considered, provided something bad doesn't happen to you, the chances you're living a relatively normal, maybe one or two years less than what someone else who doesn't have HIV, you feel like you've won the race, but you can't erase the years of all the death that you've seen and experienced that who's, you know, died right in front of you. And that, so that's, that's where I think that even though you say you won the race, at a, at, a, at a personal cost, you won the race. It's interesting that you say that, I was gonna ask you if you had PTSD. And it's interesting that you raised the AIDS crisis and not COVID. It's a different type. It's a different type. Because the, PD, the PTSD of, of day after day, morning, noon and night, personally taking care of desperately ill and dying young people, that gives you uh, one type of a, 
of a post-traumatic stress. The post-traumatic stress of the early months of COVID, I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating, I wasn't drinking. If it wasn't for my wife, Christine, when she would see me come home and I said, you've got to drink some water. Did you eat anything today? You know, I was losing weight and it was it. That, that is a different kind of a stress. That was more of not personally failing, but seeing all of these things accumulate and happen to you. You've dealt with um, seven pre presidents. Yes. Starting with Reagan. Reagan, In right. fact, he did not have a good track record right. in dealing with the AIDS crisis. That was your first experience of dealing with a president. How do you manage to get the best possible out of them? How did you, yeah. how did you work with them to get what you needed? That's a great question, and it relates to, to a principle that I've lived by starting with President Reagan. I remember when I was called the first time to go brief President Reagan, and I was talking to my friend, who I consider, he's about 15 years older than I as mentor, and he said, you know, one of the things you should remember, whenever you go into the White House and go under that awning of the West Wing to go in to see the president, you should whisper in your own ear, this may be the last time that I'm going to be walking into this building because you may have to tell the president an inconvenient truth that they don't like to hear, which means you may not get asked back again. So if you're okay with not getting asked back again, you're going to do fine because they're either going to respect you or they're going to shoot the messenger. And I've lived by that with every single president where I had to, to be very honest with them, very respectful, but never be afraid to tell them the cold, honest truth. And I did that with Reagan, and I did that with George H.W. Bush, and I did that with Clinton and George W. Bush and Obama and, and uh, Trump, and now with Biden. And it's always a little bit different but it always needs to be driven by being honest and clear and articulate in what you're saying to them and not being afraid to disappoint them. Uh, and for the most part, that worked. <laughs> for the most part, that worked. A little worked. tricky at the yeah, end. Perhaps. A little tricky at well. I have something to show you. Yes. So we're going to let the cameras reset and okay. then we're going to go and walk. I have a... Okay. It won't surprise you, but. I want to show you anyway. Okay. I wish I could say I was giving you a present, but I'm not giving you a present though. I'm just going to show you something. This is the Dr. Fauci, this is your life moment. So we were talking earlier about how you studied classics and, you've, and you were good yeah. reciting the Iliad, but I think your destiny was always to be in medicine. <laughs> that is what on, is this? That is 83rd Street and 13th Avenue in Brooklyn. That's my father's pharmacy, where I used to, on my Schwinn bike, deliver prescriptions or the houses around the neighborhood. And that window up there was my bedroom, right there. So you lived above the shop? I lived right above the pharmacy. And my father worked in that, in that place seven days a week. And on the weekends and summers, I used to deliver uh, prescriptions on my bicycle. And he went to Columbia and studied. Yeah, he, my, fa my, my father went to Columbia. Was he happy when you became a doctor? Forget that Greek and Latin business. Yeah. No, he was quite, quite proud of me. I happy. bet he was. Yeah. I yeah. bet he was. I love this photograph. If you had not been a, a top doctor, this is what you would have been. Yeah. Yes, I was. I love sports. I was a very good basketball player in high school. But then, my father, who you see here, yeah, I get the the genes from him. He uh -huh. was very, very fast. He was actually the New York City High School Athletic Association champ in high school in the 220 and the 440 yard dash. So I inherited his speed which made me a really good basketball player, but I also inherited his height. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, no disrespect. And I don't know very much about sports, but I do know that basketball players are kind of giants. Yeah, well, so I... And I hate to point out the obvious, but... Yeah, no, I actually was a really good high school basketball player. Did you ever play with Barack Obama? No, I... I, I Talking of your relationship he, with presidents, yeah, he, just occurred he, to He's me. such a great guy. I challenge, you know, he's like 6'3", and he's very good. So I, 
we, I've gotten to know him well, and we've become sort of friends. And I joke around saying I want to challenge him to uh, to playing basketball because I'm I'm so fast that no matter how good he is, I'll be able to dribble around him. And he says, "Don't trash talk me because I'll really take care of you on the court." <laughs> wow, what a beautiful lady she is. That was 1985, right here in Georgetown. I've been lucky enough to meet your wife. She is an extraordinary woman. She's very... Who has an extraordinary career of her own. Yes, she is quite accomplished. She's done some incredible things in, in clinical bioethics. She's one of the most respected bioethicists in the country. Do you feel that Christine and your daughters have paid the price of your success and celebrity? And I don't mean celebrity crassly, because I know you never sought it, you know. but that they are the ones that have paid the price. Yeah, they, my three daughters take some characteristics from me and some from Christine. The thing that they take from Christine is they're a very private person. They don't like attention. They don't like publicity. Um, and they like to just do their thing. And they've all public service minded and like to lead a good life, they really don't like what's going on. I mean, and they're paying the price. I mean, my, my daughters, they're in their early thirties, you know, they get threatened. They mm. you get crazy people who know their phone number, know where they work. You know, it's very frightening for a 31 year old girl to get a text message saying, we know where you live, you know, and that's really, disturbing. Did you feel guilty about that? I do a little bit, yeah. It's a lovely photo. Yeah, that's great. Did you know you were going to be influential? Did you grow no, up thinking? No, I, I just wondered, I just, I wanted, to, I wanted to serve people. I wanted to do something. You've done it. Well, I hope so. <laughs> Congratulations and thank, thank you. you very much. No, you're thank welcome. You. You're welcome.